Welcome to Intergenerational Politics, a podcast that makes politics engaging and relevant to all generations. This is Victor Xi, I'll be an incoming freshman next year at UCLA, was elected as the youngest Joe Biden delegate in Illinois and also co-hosts this podcast with Jill. And I'm Jill Wine-Banks, delighted to be Victor's co-host. I'm the author of The Watergate Girl, based on my experience as the only woman on the trial team. And of course, I had to show my book because we're talking to a famous author today, and we're going to be talking about her book. Um, I'm also an MSNBC legal analyst and former general counsel of the U.S. Army and a bunch of other things. But we're very happy today to be with uh, our special guest Yes. So we are joined today by Mary Trump, who is the perfect guest to help us understand or try to make sense of President Trump's past actions and policies and to evaluate his underlying psychology and potential for future harm in the next month and in the next four years. Mary Trump is the niece of Donald Trump, a psychologist and the author of Too Much and Never Enough, How My Family Created the World's Most Dangerous Man, and soon to be author of a second book called The Reckoning. And we will be talking to her about all of this. Thank you so much for being here, Mary. We're delighted. Oh, gosh, Jill, I'm thrilled. I'm really excited (laughs) to be here with you. And I just want to show my book, too, so people please. (laughs) Oh, here's the cover. Wait, we have a copy with the picture. Hold it up, Victor. Right here. I just can't have that laying around my house. (laughs) Oh. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, I get that. I really do. But. In fact, let's start talking about that book, because as a fellow author, that's always the first thing I want to talk about. Um, And you have a very unique perspective on Donald Trump because you are a psychologist, but you're also his niece and you basically have known him your whole life. So that made me wonder whether this dual viewpoint as both a professional and as a relative made it easier or harder to write your book. Oh, that's a great question. Um, in some ways, it was both. You know, I think as, as a family member, it made it harder because um, not the stuff about Donald so much, um, but the stuff about my dad and my grandfather, yeah. you know, that was uh, really um, difficult in ways I could not have anticipated because I was revisiting things I had very deliberately chosen not to think about for many, many years, you know, like decades. So dredging all of that up um, was definitely a challenge, um, especially as, as some of that was happening uh, during COVID, um, which made everything harder. Right. Uh, but in terms of my training, it actually made it easier because, uh, you know, I got to, t- I had to take a step back a little bit and try to be objective as far as I was possible under the circumstances. And I was able to understand things in a way that I never did before, because it's not like I was ever before this book interested in um, in, uh, in analyzing my family from a clinical perspective. So um, hmm. it ended up being, although difficult, a really fascinating journey. And I learned a lot. That does sound fascinating. And It makes me think you are good at compartmentalizing and suppressing your own personal feelings to make this more professional evaluation. Do you think that's true? Yeah. When I started this book, I had three rules. Uh, One was um, no anger, no bitterness. Um, Mm -hmm. Two was uh, don't engage in any ad hominem attacks which I don't do anyway, but you know, I wanted to, that needed to be a rule as well. And the third one was don't be uh, demeaning of anybody, including myself. So those really helped me. Um, I mean, the hardest one was uh, anger <laughs> for sure, but it wouldn't have worked if I had come at this from a place of having been wronged uh, and and with those feelings. And again, in terms of my dad, that was really difficult. Yeah, that's, you know, I, I had a similar problem because I was sharing in my book, not just Watergate uh, history, but my own personal traumas during that time, which included a bad marriage, which I wanted to be honest about, yeah. but to be protective of my ex-husband in a way, 
Yeah, I mean, I just want to say something really quickly because your, yeah. your book is phenomenal. And, and the part about it that I found most moving was the personal stuff because not because it to me it was so connected with the professional stuff or it, at least it 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 gave a perspective on the professional stuff that that we wouldn't have had otherwise and it was also incredibly incredibly brave so i i really appreciated that um wow. so thank you <laughs> thank uh, you thank you uh, <laughs> thank you so one of the questions i'm frequently asked um in book tours is what was the moment you thought to yourself I simply must write this book and I must do it now. Mm -hmm. What, what was that moment for you? Uh, it was actually after, um, I had been working with the, uh, New York times team who wrote that astonishingly brilliant investigative piece on my family's finances. Right. Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, I use the word the phrase working with very loosely they did all the work i just handed over a bunch of documents um but you know it wasn't just that i actually i had lots of conversations with them giving them background and um when i decided to take the leap to help them with by giving them the documents i realized for the first time that i actually had proof of something yeah. And, you know, the question I get is, well, why didn't you do this four years ago when it could have helped? Well, it wouldn't have helped because I didn't have anything. It literally would have been my word against his. He was getting away with everything, including insulting people like John McCain uh, and disabled reporters and, 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 you know, admitting to sexual assault of women on tape. So what could I possibly have said? But with this article, it essentially um, distilled all of the information that in, that existed in those 40,000 pages of documents, which belonged to me. So I finally had something concrete right. to, to point to and say, look, it's not just my opinion anymore. And also in the, in the course of all of those incredible conversations I had with Sue Craig and Russ Butner, I realized that this is a really incredible story. Mm -hmm. And I had, I knew Donald was going to be a total disaster and not being able to do anything was driving me crazy. Just sitting on the sidelines when he enacted the Muslim ban, when he started kidnapping and incarcerating children and things were getting worse and worse every day. I was like, you know what? I have something that I can hold in my hand now, this article. And um, I have a story and it's time because people need to know exactly who this person is. It's, and it probably did make a difference. Uh, you said, people said, well, you should have done it four years ago, but it may have helped in the election outcome in 2020. Do you, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, you know, that, that was my hope. There's a, obviously it's impossible to gauge and it's also, it's, a, it's impossible to gauge um, what kind of influence it may or may not have from the privacy of your own living room. You know, it's like, we're not out in the world. So yeah. You know, uh, I'm getting a very narrow slice of um, people uh, who have read it or maybe been affected by it. But, you know, I've, I've heard from people on Twitter saying that their uh, Republican brother-in-law read the book and voted for Biden. So that's incredibly gratifying. Um, it doesn't change the fact, however, and I don't mean to be negative, but um, because I, I am, if that's the case, I, I'm, it's, something I'm, I would be very proud of, uh, but 74 million people, <laughs> you know, <laughs> still voted for the guy, yeah. uh, which is yeah. just extraordinary. So did you think, or, or just broadly speaking, while he was on the campaign trail and now four years as president, did anything surprise you or was all of this predictable based on the man you knew uh, in a family setting? Uh, absolutely nothing he did surprised me. Um, the only thing that surprised me uh, from the beginning was the extent to which the entirety of elected Republicans was willing to uh, sell its soul for this incompetent, unworthy, cruel, despicable, um, inexperienced man who knows nothing. You know, that that continues to surprise me, actually. I don't know why it shouldn't anymore, but it, it does. 
it surprises me too. Yeah. And I wonder if in your uh, training, there's anything that you could say about what it is that Donald Trump has that makes the Republican Party and his voters so loyal and so ignore facts and policies that hurt them. Yeah, you know, I think um, it's much more complicated when we're talking about his voters. But if we're just focusing on Republicans in Congress or in the cabinet, I think I think there are three general categories. There are the true believers who, in my view, are incredibly weak and, uh, and also admire uh, what they perceive to be Donald's strength, which by the way, doesn't exist. He's an incredibly weak person as well. However, he has what they think is the, the, he's rich and he is unfortunately legitimately powerful right now. So they admire those things and they aspire to them in some ways, I suppose. Uh, and they like being around it. And as you've probably noticed, if you're sycophantic enough, Donald will have you on over to the White House, no matter who you are. Um, so there's those people, which I don't think there's much we can do about them. There are people in the middle who are just afraid. They're afraid of a mean tweet. They want to cling to their power, so they don't want to disrupt anything. In these are the people who are in private talk about how horrible he is, and then publicly either say nothing or just go along with it. And then there are the people like Mitch McConnell and Bill Barr. Uh, and one of the fascinating things about Donald is, yes, he appeals to weak people whom he can use, but he also is somebody who, because of his um, character, so to speak, uh, is eminently useful to smarter, more powerful people. So mm -hmm. people like Bill, uh, Bill Barr and Mitch McConnell have no use for Donald as a human being, but they know how to get whatever they want to get out of him. They're the most dangerous in my view. Oh my God. Well, I'm getting very, uh, I'm getting a lot of Steve Schmidt, Rick Wilson vibes from that. Um, but um, I want to move on to um, the opening of your book. And uh, if you don't mind, I want you to read um, something on page 26. And it's basically in the opening of your book, you talk about how uh, Trump's character and behavior was influenced by his father, um, Fred. I think it might be uh, fun for you to read that and nice for our audience to hear that from you. Got it. <clears throat> From the beginning, Fred's self-interest skewed his priorities. His care of his children, such as it was, reflected his own needs, not theirs. Love meant nothing to him, and he could not empathize with their plight, one of the defining characteristics of a sociopath. He expected obedience, that was all. Children don't make such distinctions, and his kids believed that their father loved them or that they could somehow earn his love. But they also knew, if only on an unconscious level, that the, their father's love, as they experienced it, was entirely conditional. Um, so, so that is, um, you know, a, a tough assessment, and I assume that attitude did have a dramatic impact on who Donald is now, right? Would, would you agree with that? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, mm -hmm. his intense maneuverings to. Um, change the narrative when he has been humiliated by something. And we also see it in the way he so gleefully humiliates other people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think one through line, especially with your book, is just how much you mentioned how environments from a young age shape children. And I, I guess, you know, that to me, that to a lot of people, it seems like basic psychology, but can you kind of speak more to how much kind of environments do shape children at such a young age and why, you know, if you're if you're raised to kind of have, you know, um, you know, if you're raised to despise humiliation or, or weakness, how that affects the person once they grow older. Yeah, I mean, if we if we look at it in terms of uh, Donald, for example, um, you know, when he was two and a half, his mother became very ill and not her fault. Uh, she was absent from his life for a significant period of time, almost a year. Two and a half is an extraordinarily important developmental period in a child's life. Um, so like that's when children most need to be seen, um, you know, while, as they're developing their individuality, that's when they most need to be soothed. Um, and that's most when they need uh, to have their needs attended to, right? So 
with her absence, he essentially lost his primary connection to uh, human love, right? Um, he had older siblings who were, you know, had their own needs. And the only person who really could have stepped in was my grandfather, the sociopath, <laughs> who even then um, was only interested in his oldest son mm -hmm. and namesake, my dad, who was seven and a half years older than Donald. Mm -hmm. So you have a child in this terrifying situation in which, um, you know, he never knows when his needs are going to be met. Uh, he never knows um, if he's going to be left alone or for how long he's going to be left alone. There was nobody there to explain these things to him. So in order to survive that psych psychologically and emotionally, he had to develop these very intense uh, defense mechanisms, mm -hmm. um, which over time kind of hardened into personality traits like, um, you know, pretending that he couldn't make any mistakes, pretending that he didn't really care about other people, being a bully, that kind of thing. The tragedy of that, or th there are two tragedies. One is when my grandmother recovered to the extent that she did, she didn't really do anything to uh, heal the wounds that had been created by her absence in the first place. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, which maybe was even worse or maybe uh, was made possible by the fact that my grandmother didn't really intervene. The defense mechanisms that Donald developed and the character tra traits that they resulted in appealed to my grandfather because he wanted his successor to be a killer, to be a tough guy, to be somebody who would win at all costs. And that's who Donald became uh, one to stave off the terror and the isolation, but two, to make sure that he didn't suffer the same fate as his older brother. That, that is for sure. Um, and then you also mentioned that Fred hated weakness. Um, you, you write that Donald's uh, older brother, Freddie, who is um, your father, um, did not become Fred's successor as intended because Fred found him too weak and that was basically a deal breaker for um, your grandfather, Fred. I um, mean, so as a result of um, your kind of fa um, your father's failure to please your grandfather, um, you write that your father became uh, addicted to alcohol and then unfortunately then died. So that information plus the information that we've already discussed about Fred and Donald makes this seem to be like a really toxic family in a sense. Um, you know, did Fred's behavior also affect the president's mother and the sister? Or kind of how did the family dynamic kind of play out? I, yeah, it was an incredibly toxic family. And it, Again, when I started thinking about the book, one thing that struck me was that my grandparents had five children and every single one of them is in one way or another, a deeply damaged, if not destroyed human being. Mm. That's quite a record, you know? Um, that's, that, that speaks to horrific, a horrific um, household and horrific parenting. Um, I think that clearly my grandfather was the driving force and he was a sociopath. There's no, no two ways about that. Mm -hmm. But my grandmother um, played her own part. You know, she was not, she was not uh, either able or willing to protect the kids from uh, their father. And she was, um, you know, she was really self-involved in a way that made it difficult, if not impossible for her to give her children the kind of comfort they needed uh, over time. And I think her, it was her relationship with Donald, or I guess I should say her treatment of Donald that, that probably had more of an impact uh, than with any of her other children. It is totally fascinating. <laughs> For sure, yeah. Um, yeah. You know, you mentioned the successor and um, how Father Freddie was supposed to be the original successor, um, but then uh, I, um, it was because of Freddie's weakness that I guess Fred then turned his attention to Donald. Um, so I guess w what in particular made Donald so special for Fred, or was it that you know he was just the only other son, so he, you know he became one you know by default, or was it you know any chance that his sister Mary Ann could have also become one, or was it also maybe because of gender um, in that scenario? Well, first of all, there, my grandfather was a world class misogynist, so there's a, more of a misogynist than Donald, mm -hmm. 
honestly, oh, wow. which is saying something. Um, so there's no way um, my Aunt Marianne, who was the oldest child and very bright uh, and, and capable, uh, but there was no way he would ever in a billionaire's turn to her. Um, and as for my dad, th this is the problem. It's not that he was weak. It's that according to my grandfather's worldview, right. he was weak. So Freddie was kind. He was generous. He was really funny. Um, and he was incredibly accomplished, but in ways that my grandfather found trivial. You know, he was a consummate boatsman. Um, he was a great fisherman. And as it turned out, he was a brilliant pilot. Uh, but none of those things was necessary uh, in running a real estate empire. So they were dismissed out of hand. So it's not that he turned away from Freddie because he was, um, you know, a bad person or a weak, you know, weak in the, the way we would consider it weak. Uh, you know, he wasn't lazy or anything like that. It's just that he didn't appeal to my grandfather's sense of, you know, what was necessary. And also, as many sociopaths do, I, you know, my grandfather used other people as extensions of, of himself. And as soon as he realized that, that Freddie wasn't going to be the, a person he could use to his own ends, he turned his focus to Donald, um, who, having witnessed all of this mm -hmm. from the advantage of being seven and a half years younger, was absolutely determined to play the role required of him. Otherwise, he would have ended up uh, just as dismantled and destroyed as his older brother, who, by the way, was just, you know, objectively speaking on paper, a much better person and a much more accomplished person than Donald ever could be. So that was also very confusing. But when you live in a family in which everything is a zero sum game and there can only be one winner, um, and you've seen what can happen if you don't do what's necessary in order to win, you become Donald, basically. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, well, let's so so we talked about Donald when when he was a child. Um, I just want to move on a little bit to when he was an adolescent and and Trump's misbehavior. So you write a lot in the book how it, that consisted of fighting, bullying, arguing. You know, th th I guess that shouldn't surprise us, but it reached to a point where um, Fred uh, sent Donald to New York Military Academy. So I guess um, first, like, why was that? And then also, did sending Trump to military school help at all, or do you think that might have made things a little bit worse? Oh, um, well, first of all, my grandfather sent him because it was easier. You know, Donald was a pain in the ass. <laughs> he was getting in trouble at school and it was a school in which my grandfather was on the board of directors. <laughs> so, you know, it was just, it was annoying and he didn't want to deal with it. I don't think, honestly, I don't think he particularly cared one way or the other. He was still focused on Freddie um, and, you know, he wasn't home. He worked all the time. Uh, so if the school hadn't complained about it, I don't think he would have bothered. But my grandmother was also at her wits end because uh, Donald treated her so poorly. Mm. Um, but that, by the way, was also I think that was the final break uh, with between her and Donald, because not only did she not lift a finger to protest against his being sent away in eighth grade, um, she really wanted him gone. So I think that for Donald was the final betrayal. As for his experience at the military academy, I, I actually think it made things worse because it was another environment in which he learned that what matters is having the power, not deserving it. Um, because it was a very, back then, um, top-down environment in which if you were the superior officer, so to speak, you could do whatever you wanted. You could beat up underclassmen if they looked at you funny, you know? So he learned that, okay, it doesn't matter if I'm good or if I'm skilled, it only matters if I have more power. Uh, so that that's not a lesson he needed and reinforced, but it was. Well, consistent with that, you write a lot about uh, the strong man desire of your uncle. Uh, and of course, the American people have seen that for ourselves in terms of how he portrays himself and also how he affiliates himself with um, authoritarian dictatorial leaders who would be the strong men that he aspires to be. Um, but 
what we're seeing now is in addition to that, he won't accept losing. So what in your professional opinion explains these two character traits, uh, you know, both the, the strong man desire and the refusal to, I would say, see facts and reality, uh, mm-hmm. not accept losing. Um, and what are the consequences now with Trump refusing to acknowledge Biden's victory and telling his voters, I really won. I yeah. got more votes in Georgia. And despite three recounts that have all said he lost. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, those are, those are great questions because um, we are going to be dealing with them for a while, unfortunately. As for the strongman man stuff, um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, my grandfather, for reasons which kind of continue to escape me, because we're talking about real estate in Queens and Brooklyn in the 50s, but my grandfather wanted a killer. Like it wasn't that dangerous to collect rent, but whatever. <laughs> so, um, you know, Donald could never acknowledge weakness of any kind and, um, you know, was clearly the most important person in my family, even eventually more important than my grandfather, uh, who, as he got older, became kind of sycophantic towards his middle son, which was very weird. But the problem is, Donald is a very weak person and uh, he really doesn't have any uh, internal strengths. He's not good at anything. Uh, He's just been really lucky. So to me, the tell here isn't his power grabs because that's what quote unquote strong men do, right? They try to overturn elections. They try to delegitimize their opponents. It's, It's the way he behaves with legitimate strong men like Putin and Erdogan and uh, Un. Uh, you know, he behaves towards them like his followers behave towards him. Uh, you know, in those relationships, he's the sycophant. So it's, it's really fascinating, but I think, you know, it just shows that when he's confronted with real strength, and don't get me wrong, I mean, they're despicable mm-hmm. people um, and, the world would be better off if none of those people was in power, but they are not through, well, in some cases through chance and luck and, you know, just having been born to the right person, but, you know, they've been trained in a way that makes them um, not just powerful, but capable of wielding the power, which is something Donald never will be. So I think we see two things happening. Um, generally speaking, with this, his, his uh, reaction to this decisive loss to President Biden. Mm. First of all, we see the desperation of a man who has aspired to something, who, who believes that he deserves to be in the position he's in, despite having done nothing to earn it. Um, and I'm, I believe uh, that, you know, he didn't legitimately win in 2016 either. Um, but that also plagues him because he knows that in some ways he's never been legitimate. You know, he wasn't even the legitimate successor to my grandfather, um, but that's a different issue. So we're seeing that desperation. Um, he kind of doesn't understand. He so deserves to be an autocrat forever he doesn't understand how that's not happening, especially given the fact that um, you know he basically did everything in his power to ch- cheat, lie, and steal his way into another four years in the Oval Office. The other more, in some ways more troubling part for us is the fact that he's in a situation he's never been in in his life before, which is that he's lost. Um, again, he's never won anything legitimately, but in my family, it's not the process of winning, it's the fact of winning. So even if you won by cheating, lying, and stealing, all that matters is that you won. Mm. And he's always been able to brazen his way through a quote unquote loss and turn it somehow into a win, whether it's declaring bankruptcies, but then getting hundreds of million dollars more from banks, you know, um, whether it's uh, building a, a development with which he had nothing to do, but he gets to take credit for it. Whatever, whatever the case may be. Now, 
we've seen he's tried everything in his power to steal this one so he can get the win and he can't do it. And that's making him insane. And that's very, 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 very dangerous because um, one, it's it's something he's emotionally and psychologically incapable of processing and, and dealing with. And two, he knows that if he can't overturn the results of this election, he no longer has the power of the Oval Office protecting him as of January 20th, 12.01 PM. And he is looking down the barrel of lawsuits, of um, serious financial difficulties, because why, why would the banks not call in their debt at this point? And three, very serious state level criminal charges uh, from which he cannot pardon himself. So he's a very cornered man. It's um, definitely he is facing all of that. And one sort of additional question here is, do you think he's delusional or does he actually um, somehow believe? I mean, I, I guess it's the same thing. He has. I, do you think he's delusional in believing, for example, his own claims that he won the 2020 election? Or does he just not care about fact and he's just blatantly lying? Yeah, well, yeah, this is this is one of the things about Donald that's kind of fascinating. Um, and it doesn't it only happens when something's there's a lot at stake. Um, I think initially he knows the truth um, and that saying he won is a lie. But he it the urgency of making the lie true is so great. And the urgency of getting other people to believe the lie is so great that he kind of gaslights himself into believing it, which is why we see over time, his claims kind of become more grandiose and ridiculous, but at the same time, more compelling to people who are willing to listen, because there is this weird uh, sense of authenticity about them. Like who would go on and on about this if there weren't some grain of truth, right? According to people who were primed to listen to and believe him. So I think that's, that's much more dangerous because, uh, I mean, it's dangerous anyway, but when there's this air of authenticity behind these completely um, ridiculous and uh, erroneous claims, that changes um, the fact that, that puts us in a situation where He's convincing people that they've had something taken from them, which makes them angry. And again, is going to make it so much harder for the incoming Biden-Harris administration. So maybe the most important question then is, is there any way for people who care about facts to get those facts into the minds of the people who are believing your uncle? He, he uses what I would consider to be traditional propaganda tools. Mm -hmm. Say it loud and say it often. Yep. And as you said, be authentic about it. But how, how can that be overcome? What message can get through to people so that they understand that there was nothing fraudulent about the election, that he lost it fair and square? Um, is there any hope for that? I don't think there is. Um, and, and that's entirely down to our elected Republicans. What they have done here is it's beyond disgraceful. It's anti-democratic, it's anti-American, and they should all suffer serious consequence for it, which I'm afraid they won't, but every single one of those 126 Republican representatives who signed on to that frivolous, fraudulent uh, lawsuit brought by the Texas AG uh, should not be seated in the next Congress. They should not be. You don't, you should not be rewarded in this country for sedition. Um, so I think we missed, um, we missed the opportunity because every day that went by um, with Republican leadership saying absolutely nothing, refusing to acknowledge President Biden is a day in which more and more people started to doubt the, uh, the legitimacy of the election. And um, it's a tragedy 
uh, but it's also a uh, criminal. It's playing a role right now in the Georgia election. Yeah. Um, Loeffler is still refusing to admit that he lost the election. And um, it, it's, it's really seriously frightening. You've made some very good points there. So thank you on that. Um, I, and I think that raises a point um, that you write about in your book. And this is a quote that um, I found striking, I think kind of encapsulates everything about Donald is that this is far beyond garden variety narcissism. Donald is not simply weak. His ego is a fragile thing that must be bolstered every moment because he knows deep down that he is nothing of what he claims to be. Um, I guess, you know, one word that people at the Lincoln Project often throw around is, you know, it's become a cult of personality. Like, would you agree with that? Like, and I guess like first like define cult and then like, how does that apply to what Trump has made his supporters and Republicans in Congress into? Yeah, <laughs> this is a very difficult topic for me to grapple with because um, I'm not objective, obviously. I, I tried as a thought experiment uh, about a month ago. I said, okay, you need to put aside your own prejudices, find something good about Donald that kind of can give you some insight into why people admire him, which again, don't, don't understand. I couldn't come up with anything. I could have probably 25 years ago, but I don't, and this is the problem. I look at him and I see a, an unworthy, incompetent, cruel, I can go on and on for hours with adjectives that describe what I think of him. So it makes it really difficult for me to see what is it that other people are attracted to here? He's so weak, he's so whiny, he's so pathetic, he's so unintelligent and so what is it that's going on? And I think it's because, uh, you know, the only way to understand it is to stop looking at it from the perspective of somebody who doesn't admire him at all. Okay, so what could be going on? Um, part of the thing is that there are people, a certain percentage of people in any society who have authoritarian personalities. They are attracted to the quote unquote strongman, even if the strong man is really a weak man. Um, but you know, the weak idea, person's idea of a strong man. Um, also, because of his privilege and position, you know, as I said earlier, he does have power to which people and money, none of which really belongs to him, but you know, most people don't believe that, um, which people find attractive and they want to be around that. Uh, and more than anything else though, I think it's, it's, it's kind of simple. He hates the right people, you know, they like his ra racism and misogyny and cruelty, uh, which is terrifying, but he's also elevated the um, politics of grievance to an art form. Mm -hmm. And he appeals to people who feel left behind, who feel that they have been underserved um, by their government. And, you know, this is something else we can thank Republicans for. This has been a 40 years long project to undermine people's faith in, in, in government and convince them that government is a, like a hostile foreign power when the government is us, you know, it's ours. It's, it, it doesn't just represent us, it is us. You know, it's like this thing with the, you know, federal money, that's our money. It's not like, it belongs to the federal government who like, you know, has been having its own bake sales. It's, it's our money. So, um, you know, you convince somebody over time to vote against their own self-interest and be suspicious of uh, their own government. And like, that's why we see people saying, oh, Obamacare is the worst, but I love the ACA. Mm, well, okay. Keep your government hands off my Medicaid. Well, guys, I got news for you. So um, it's, it's again, it's, it's just another uh, stunt that's been pulled on these people, uh, which is driven in part, and I, well, not just in part, I think largely by the um, demographic changes that are going to put the Republicans in a minority for all time, which is why they're mm -hmm. so desperate. So they're gonna do whatever they can to stoke up the, the, the rage and division on the right, no matter how 
unfounded the reasons for it might be. Mm -hmm. One one question I think a lot of people are wondering about is will do you think Trump will walk out of office? You know, now that he is projected to be, you know, he's the loser of the election. Um, do you think he'll walk out of office and just, I guess, fade away, or will he continue elevating himself and Trumpism? And like, will it get worse from here? Like, is this just the beginning for him? Yeah, <laughs> I <laughs> fading away is not something that he will do willingly. Um, but uh, you know, as I was talking uh, to Don Lemon last night, actually. And he said something really interesting because, you know, I'm, I'm focused on Donald's desperation vis-a-vis -vis criminal charges and potential bankruptcies and lawsuits and no longer having the power of the Oval Office pr to protect him. And Don was saying that he thinks that the thing that Donald's most terrified of is no longer being relevant and I mean, I think that's part of it, but I think he's right. I think that is the worst thing that could happen to him mm. is being irrelevant. Um, so we, we see what he's fighting tooth and nail. Like that's, he's, the reason he isn't concede, he didn't concede initially was because he couldn't wrap his mind around the fact that after all of the cheating he had been doing, it didn't work. Um, and he'd never lost before. So how can, how can you, you know, take that in? But over time, it became more about staying relevant because lame duck people kind of are beside the point, aren't they? And just wait until after inauguration. Historically, it's sort of like Barack who? I mean, obviously not to that extent, but you know what I'm saying? Like we don't, you know, he's going to go off and do his own thing and we're not going to pay that much attention. And if that happened to Donald, I think, I think he would cease to exist. So he's going to do whatever he can that therefore, but it, it shouldn't be up to him. It is incumbent upon the media to turn the page. And if they don't, they will once again be failing this country in a way so egregious that, you know, we may never get out of this. That is a tragedy, I think, the way you're describing it. Um, you, you've mentioned a number of times the money, the power. Um, I, I want to focus on the money, um, his taxes, and how much he may owe, and uh, thank you for your role in bringing to light mm -hmm. some of the facts that underlay what he has done. Um, based on everything you know, do you think that the state investigations, Cy Vance um, or Letitia James, at the, who's the New York State Attorney General, um, do you think that there are crimes that he will be charged with or that there will at least be uh, taxes that he will owe? Yeah, I, I don't have any any special insight into that. I haven't been contacted. The, the documents that I had in my possession are very old. Um, so they wouldn't be useful. But what I will say is that between the 2018 article that the Times wrote, mm -hmm. essentially rewriting the financial history of my family and showing that, you know, Donald was a millionaire from the time he was a toddler um, and was not a self-made man. And they did engage in all sorts of tax fraud and money laundering. And the article they published recently um, about more specifically about Donald's taxes mm -hmm. um, and how little he made um, and how few taxes he paid, um, what we see is a pattern of behavior. There's literally no reason for me to believe that that pattern ever stopped or that, sorry, that those behaviors never stopped. Uh, so I think um, there's plenty there for Vance and James to, to go forward. Also, I'd say, even though they, these things don't necessarily have anything to do with each other, but I think that the, the way Donald has behaved since the election um, has been so abhorrent and dangerous that in, it increases the urgency of holding him accountable, even if it's only at the state level. So in other words, obviously there, you know, there, there's, nothing to charge him with, okay. But if there is, um, 
there's every reason to think that this time they will, unlike pass in the past when they either looked the other way or decided not to bother. That's not going to happen this time, especially if the Biden administration, and personally, I think this would be a really big mistake, decides not to allow, well, I don't know, that's the right word, but decides to do, to make the same mistake other administrations have made, including Obama's and say, you know, the past is the past, we need to look forward. No, we don't need to look forward. We need to find out what happened um, and hold people accountable for the first time in our history. Uh, but, you know, if that doesn't happen, then I think there's gonna be even more pressure uh, at the state level. Well, you're talking to somebody who has believed since the time of Nixon that a sitting president can be indicted yep. and should be indicted when the evidence supports, uh, supports it. Yep. And so you won't have any argument from me about holding someone accountable. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I just, I wanna refer, before I turn this back to Victor, to an article that a neighbor sent me last night um, that arrived just sort of coincidentally before talking to you. And it's called, What the Science of Addiction Tells Us About Trump. And it's written by James Kimmel Jr., a lecturer in psychiatry at the Yale University School of Medicine. And uh, I, I know I didn't give you any advance warning or let you see this, but uh, it, it so reflects some of the things you're saying and says that we need to be compassionate about Donald Trump because it's not necessarily a moral failure, that it is sort of um, much like drug addiction, that it is a physical, mental disorder. And so does that you know, make you have any compassion for the adult uh, as opposed to, you, know, you might be compassionate about the child who was treated badly and developed these defensive mechanisms, but it's sort of like blaming your parents when you're 40 years old. It's time to stop blaming them and take responsibility for developing better behaviors. Um, it, it didn't, it, I thought it was an interesting article, but it didn't make me feel compassionate about an adult not seeking help because it does also say these traits require assistance. They require professional help. Um, can you comment on that at all? And I'll send you the article later. Yeah, I, I would love to read it actually. Um, you know, I, I, think, I think there is a lot of explanatory power in, in, in viewing Sir Donald's behaviors as addictive. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, addictions run through my family. Um, my dad obviously was an alcoholic. I think my grandmother was an alcoholic. Uh, there mm -hmm. were first cousins. Uh, my, in my father's generation, there were first cousins who died from alcoholism. Um, but, you know, Donald's addictions take all different forms, obviously. And I think Donald is addicted to attention. I think he's addicted to uh, money. Um, and, you know, maybe the power that comes with money, not sure. But, uh, you know, you can't treat something that's not acknowledged, right? And as you said, it requires that. Um, so you can't blame somebody for being addicted. You can't blame, you can't even blame them for not acknowledging it because, you know, he's also a narcissist in some ways. So like if a narcissist goes to therapy, it's not to, because they think there's something wrong with them. It's because they think there's something wrong with everybody else, right? So, and in my family, the things that are of interest to Donald, like attention and money were normal things, at least for him, because of my grandfather, to want to have as much of as possible. That having been said, uh, and yeah, again, if you wanna have a compassion for it, you know, knock yourself out. <laughs> but, you know, as I said, I know plenty of people who had much worse childhoods who turn out to be kind, empathetic, um, and, you know, generous adults. So that's not an excuse. Have compassion for the child, sure. But as you said, we all need to grow up at some point and take responsibility. But okay, so what happens if you don't recognize what's wrong with you? Well, does an addiction to money or attention um, explain his cruelty? Mm -hmm. No. So 
people with addictions, people with mental illnesses are not necessarily bad people, but they can be, and they're just not related. You well, know, they also have it in their power to get better by getting help. And certainly your uncle's problems have been pointed out by the media for quite a long while. So, um, and, and going back to this article by Kimmel, uh, it does talk about addiction to revenge and mm. the, the good feelings that come from achieving that. Yeah. Uh, when you have the, um, the weaknesses that you've identified in your uncle. Um, but uh, let me move to one, one other question, which is about what do you think President Trump has on the Republican Party, on maybe his aides, maybe on his voters? Why is it that he has been able to continue his narrative despite the absence of facts to support it. Yeah, it is extraordinary uh, because it, it's impossible to believe that all, uh, you know, 100% of elected Republicans are just totally okay with all of this. Um, so there has to be some percentage of them who are being coerced in some way um, that some of them certainly act like they are for sure. Um, you know, again, I don't, I don't have any uh, special information about this, but um, what we do know is that uh, it wasn't just the DNC that was hacked, the RNC was hacked. Difference is none of the RNC emails has been released to date as far as I know. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think Donald has whatever somebody like Putin has. I mean, look at, look, look at what we just saw, learned, sorry, about this, and this vast and terrifying cyber attack by Russia. I mean, they've infiltrated practically everything, it seems like. So do we really think that because Donald has done nothing, said nothing, made no moves, again, enabled by McConnell, who's also done nothing, even though he certainly had the power to, would we be surprised if there aren't files on every single Republican senator and Congress. I, I, I think that would be naive to suggest that that's not the case. What I find depressing though, is that like, how bad could it be? Like I'm going to assume that some of it's really bad but some of it's just kind of humiliating life stuff, right? Is it really worth destroying your country over? Like anybody who came out and said, look, I'm being blackmailed for this reason. I'm humiliated, but my country matters. That person would be a hero for all time. But it's the it's this weakness that I just yeah. find it's kind of mind blowing, actually. Actually, the cyber attack and uh, President Trump's failure to do anything in response may actually be the most horrible crime he's committed so far. But I want to move to. Uh, I have one last question and Victor has one last question. Um, okay. You're in the process of writing your second book, The Reckoning. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us something about it and uh, when it's going to be coming out? Yeah, I'd love to. Um, this, this is a book that um, I think is similar to the first book and not, not in terms of its topic, but in terms of its mission, so to speak. Mm -hmm. uh, we are looking down the barrel of the worst mental health crisis this country has ever, ever encountered. Um, and we are at the best of times not equipped to deal with it. So in this book, I kind of take a look back to see, you know, how did we get here? Because the crises we're currently facing were completely avoidable, um, which is why I personally think that, yes, I agree with you, the, the crime Donald's committing by doing nothing about Russia's uh, continued cyber attacks, including the ones in 2016, are horrible crimes for which he really should be held accountable. But I think his m essential murder of hundreds of thousands of Americans is up there too. Um, but that's how I view it. I, you know, considering it was all avoidable. So I look back and what we, like, as we were speaking earlier about the failure to hold accountable people accountable. I mean, it started with Robert E. Lee. You know, there are universities ma named after a man who betrayed his country um, also that also that he and his uh, fellow criminals could have the privilege of continuing to torture and murder black people. Uh, you know, so it goes all the way through Andrew Johnson, Andrew Jackson, Woodrow Wilson, on and on and on to Donald. 
And, you know, we need to grapple with that and we need to be prepared. And, you know, so we, cause if we don't do that, you know, and if we don't reckon for the first time ever with the trauma in which this country was born, you know, genocide of two populations and the enslavement of a, of a population. Um, I mean, not only have we not atoned for that stuff, we, we've barely even acknowledged it. So if we don't start to do that, then things like this are going to continue to happen. So, um, and it's why we are so ill-equipped, wh why we got into this situation. So, okay, what are we going to do about it? And the, what are we going to do about it part is probably the reason I think this book is urgent because, you know, come summer when we're emerging finally from our COVID lockdown, we're going to be looking at increases in PTSD, depression, anxiety, domestic abuse, child abuse, substance abuse, the likes of which we've never seen before. We need to be prepared for it and we need to start laying the groundwork for um, changing our system so that uh, we can stop treating mental illness like it's some kind of um, you know moral failing and stop treating mental health like it's a luxury. Wow, that is a, such an important book, especially for for now. And Jill and I, I know we can't wait to read it, and we hope our audience will too. And we would love to have you back after you do write that book and it's published, because it would be such a timely book to talk about. Um, one last question, you know, for me, so I took psychology in high school, and this was such a fascinating discussion, just like the class. And I've learned a lot. But is there anything you would like to tell our audience about Trump, your first book, um, or or the one that you're writing now, and um, you know, anything that we didn't ask that you would want our viewers and listeners to know? Uh, I, I think honestly, uh, the most important thing to keep in mind is that Donald will do anything uh, to, you know, if he feels that he can't stay in power, which is, should even be coming clear to him, um, he's going to take all of us down with him if he feels like he's going down. And I know that sounds melodramatic, but I think it's, and we've seen it happening already. He's perfectly willing to destroy our democracy uh, to protect himself. So that's not going to change, especially if the Republican Party, which, by the way, is the only entity on the planet other perhaps than Vladimir Putin, who can rein him in or box him off or contain him somehow. So um, since that's the case, we need to keep putting pressure on the media to do its job. Um, and in this case, its job would be to turn to what's really important, and that's the incoming Biden-Harris administration. Yeah, for sure. Well, we thank you so much for helping us understand Trump a little bit better, um, but thank you so much for your time, Mary. It was wonderful. We enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you both so much. This was a phenomenal conversation, and I enjoyed every second of it. <laughs> Likewise. <laughs>